Hello and welcome to the Westchester Education Services webinar, The State of K-12 Education During COVID-19. I'm Nicole Tomasi, the Marketing and Conference Manager here at Westchester. We appreciate you joining us today for this timely discussion about how education has been impacted as a result of the pandemic and the effects that may be experienced at the district level over the course of the next school year. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, Westchester Education Services provides a complete range of services for educational publishers and ed tech producers of literacy, math, ELT, science, social studies, bilingual education, and translated products, including content development, art and design, production, and project management. Our services extend beyond the traditional subject areas. We create content for social emotional learning in order to meet the needs of the whole student, and we provide product reviews of educational materials against our culturally responsive education rubric to ensure that these products are diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Before I introduce our moderator, please note that your microphones will be muted for the duration of the webinar. We received some questions for our panelists beforehand and invite you to enter questions in the Q&A window that should be at the bottom center of the webinar window. We'll answer as many questions as time allows, and you'll receive a recording of today's session along with the Q&A transcript in the next day or so. We're going to begin the discussion with this poll that will be showing on the screen in the next few seconds. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kevin J. Gray, President and Chief Content Officer of Westchester Education Services. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. We have a really, um, really what I think is a really interesting and engaging uh, set of questions here and a great group of panelists. Um, let me introduce the panelists uh, because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. I'm going to do a very brief introduction, but Nicole can share a link to uh, the larger biographies on our website. Uh, so first we have Kathy Mickey, who is the managing, managing editor and senior, senior analyst at Simba Information Education Group. Uh, Kathy is our industry observer uh, in this call. Uh, then we have Sarah Cluck, Senior Director of Education Policy for the Software and Information Industry Association. Uh, Sarah uh, brings a policy perspective uh, to this call. Then we have uh, Jocelyn Reinard, who is Vice President of Dayton Public, uh, Dayton Public School. Uh, I'm sorry, she's Vice President on the Dayton Public School Board. Um, so she brings the vantage point of a, a mid-sized di urban district that serves about 14,000 students. Uh, and then finally, Dr. Roseanne Fulham, who is a compliance monitor and special education teacher at West Rocks Middle School in Norwich, uh, Connecticut. Uh, she brings a classroom uh, perspective. She is celebrating the beginning of her 42nd year in the classroom. Uh, so thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we'll let the poll run for a minute. Um, and while we do that, let's, let's kick off with, um, you know, the, the, the topic on everyone's mind and what we were all just chatting with a second ago, back to school plans. So um, there's a lot of different variants. It seems like it might be a bit of the wild, wild west out here. Um, Roseanne, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to uh, Jocelyn, since uh, you two are the two closest to, uh, you know, really the classrooms themselves. Uh, Roseanne, what is your district doing and how are you preparing for next year? Uh, okay, so Norwalk is um, quasi-urban school district. We're surrounded by a lot of very wealthy school districts of Fairfield County, but 60% of our population is free and reduced lunch. So it's really important that we have parents that need kids to come back to school. They have to work. And our goal is to provide continuous education. Parents had an option of either going hybrid or fully remote. Um, I'll talk about the remote in a minute, but the hybrid model for, is only going to be in middle school and high school. Elementary students are going to be brought back five days a week if their parents want them in school. They are doing cohorts or pods of 24 kids, but they will split that so that each class will be 12 with a teacher one day and 12 with a, a paraprofessional another day. And so that they will never mingle the 12 together. Um, they also need to spread out to more buildings because there are too many students to fill that would be overpowering. So we have the advantage of one elementary school that was going to be empty and under renovations. They are going to be busing fourth and fifth graders from three elementary schools to that location to continue to spread students out. Um, so that's how 
elementary school is going to do it if they're in person. Obviously, desks are going to be six feet apart, trying to work all that out. Teachers had to go in and take out as much of their personal things as possible to make room. Uh, middle school, where I'm at, will have an every other day model. So if you're sending your child to school, they will go to school one day and the next day will be remote in order to keep the numbers in classes down. And uh, lunches will be breakfast and lunch. We serve breakfast to everybody. Breakfast and lunch will be in the classrooms. Carts will be brought around and you will just have to take from the cart, no going to the cafeteria. We are gonna have recess. Um, middle school is gonna be on a bit of a staggered schedule so that we never have more than a certain amount of students in the hallways. But kids will basically stay into their classrooms and teachers will move. So uh, um, as a special ed teacher, I'm not completely sure how my role is gonna be, but my students are mostly uh, mainstreamed in full inclusion. So special ed teachers in that setting will be assigned to one, maybe two pods to minimize uh, moving around. And students that get what we call academic assistance, which is a special ed kind of study hall every other day for support, that'll be given to them on their days that they're remote so that a special ed teacher could have a larger group of students and be providing that support. Um, I, again, this is hypothetical because our numbers are really good right now in Connecticut. We're probably one of the best in the state, but that could change. We will also have um, a screening process every day when kids come to school, either answer online or bring in a piece of paper as they come into their homeroom and that's you answer those questions when being exposed, blah, 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 the typical questions. And the first few 15 minutes of homework, homeroom is gonna be focused on social and emotional learning just to kind of make sure kids are feeling safe. Um, that's as much as I can tell you in a nutshell because it hasn't happened yet. High school is gonna be somewhat different and I don't, can't really speak to that specifically, but they will have a little more movement but again, they're trying to minimize how many students cross paths at any one time. And if the numbers change, then everything else will change too. Okay, excellent. We have been told though, the teachers are expected to be in the building every day, all day. And I appreciate that because that's where I wanna teach. So even when you're teaching remotely? You'll be uh, in the building. The classroom. Okay, and that's, and you brought something really interesting. You're in a part of the country. There was a, an article that came out in the New York Times today showing uh, a map that I think was a, a Harvard Institute of uh, Health that had shown kind of where it might be safer to open schools and, and less safe. And, and the New England uh, area seems to be much, much more on the safer side. Um, in contrast, uh, Jocelyn, uh, Dayton Public Schools is in smack in the middle of Ohio, smack in the middle of Montgomery County, one of the top 10 counties in uh, the state wrestling with this. How, um, and, and you've, DPS has already decided to delay school um, a few weeks and then go uh, remote. How did you come to that uh, conclusion? What drove that decision and, and what challenges are you working around because of that? Sure, thank you for having me, Kevin. Um, we are now all virtual for the first quarter, at least, is what we're saying, um, just because we have to take it quarter by quarter. We had to delay the start of the school year. School was supposed to start last week. We had to delay it until the day after Labor Day, so we're starting September 8th, um, just to give teachers all the time to prepare with the, with the jump to virtual learning. We were pretty determined at the beginning of the summer that we were gonna have an in-person school year. Um, like a lot of other people, when our state shut down all schools on March 12th, we had to scramble and get everything put together. We did the best we could, but we knew it wasn't optimal. So we really wanted to make sure that when school came, was supposed to start back in, in August, that we were gonna be making sure that, you know, we had to make up all the ground that we knew that we missed in the spring. And then we were gonna be um, having a, a really um, strong school year. Um, and we really wanted to make it in person because we knew that learning happens better in person for most people. Um, but as the summer went on, the numbers in Ohio got worse and worse and worse, particularly in Montgomery County, uh, particularly in the west side of Dayton, which is where a large portion of our black population lives. Um, we could not deny the fact that COVID hits um, a lot of populations and communities harder than others, um, particularly the black community is getting hit a lot harder. Um, and so when we saw the numbers go up in Montgomery County and in Dayton and in West Dayton, 
we knew that this was not a risk that we were willing to take. And at a certain point we said, we cannot open our buildings again. We tried really hard to find every single plan that could be an accommodation that could possibly uh, present less risk to our teachers and our staff and our students. We thought about the staggered start. Um, like Roseanne, we have a very high uh, poverty district. Um, most of our students are actually free and reduced lunch. Um, a Dayton has a 30% poverty rate. And we knew that if we we're going to be going back in person, we had to try to make it work for everybody. So the staggered start wasn't an option for us in terms of thinking about the parents that would have to find childcare for at least one of their kids if they have more than one child. What if one child was on one track and another child was on another track? The daycare, trying to find it for parents would be too high of a burden. And so we held out as long as we could, but the numbers were. Um, we couldn't deny that they were getting worse and worse. So we decided a few weeks ago that we were going all virtual. And so I, I'm guessing you're watching the uh, the numbers in the area and that will that will inform, and I think this is probably true of everywhere, that'll inform what the next quarter and the next quarter look like. Yep, we're gonna wait and see what things look like in October. Um, it's too early to say. I w we all want to know, right? <laughs> That's why we're here. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so Nicole, this might be a good time to show uh, the the results. So what do we got here? So it looks like um, it looks like the majority uh, will be you know has a choice of online or in person, which was very much where Dayton Public was, um, you know, as as uh, Justin said earlier this year, or part of the week uh, in in person. So it doesn't look like it's online for. Um, all of the year, or even first part of the year, seems to be those seem to be in the minority. Um, so, okay, interesting. Uh, Sarah, you are seeing. Um, I don't see Sarah here. Did she drop off? No, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay, just dropped off my screen. Um, so, Sarah, you have a different vantage point. You're seeing this at a much higher level. What are you seeing from a policy level? What are um, states and, and districts? How, how are they exploring this? Uh, well, this is this is hard. We've seen a lot of uh, a lot of talk over the past. I can't. I just uh, did a quick count. It's been six months that we've been doing this. The time has flown by, and it's also been like the slowest six months of probably everyone's lives. Um, but it, we've seen different things coming down from policymakers at the federal level, depending on the day. Um, so uh, it, that has made the jobs of people like Jocelyn a lot harder um, to figure out what is best for their communities, um, to not have some um, help from uh, the congressional and federal um, and executive branch, those leaders. Um, but it is really how our system is set up. Um, we have set up our um, school systems in this country to lean towards local control. So giving um, folks like Jocelyn, again, um, a lot of control in these situations and ability to make these decisions. Um, but I think that there is no good answer for this that policymakers are seeing because they aren't going to be able to make everyone happy. And that makes elected officials really nervous when they can't make all of their constituents really happy. Um, so I think that's why we've seen a lot of people changing, changing um, their tone on whether it needs to be in person or out of school. And I think I've even seen um, parents struggling with the decisions too, whether or not they send their kids to school full-time or hybrid or online. And I think there, there is no right answer. And we're seeing that at all levels from all decision makers, whether it's a parent or whether it's the president. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. Um, so lots of challenges around this. Um, it sounds like even in the best of situations, there's some remote learning, which has its own challenges, um, particularly around equity and access. Uh, and it, pre it presents challenges for the companies who are also trying to drive, uh, you know, drive curriculum for the program. So um, Roseanne, I'll start, uh, come back to you. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but uh, can you tell us more about special needs students, how they're being in, impacted by uh, remote education, what, you know, what specific things need to be thought of, and then what, what can be done to lessen the gaps? Uh, okay, so let me just clarify. Special ed students, it, depending on their hours of service, 
no matter what their grade level is, may have the option of five days in person learning. Um, those students who are in more restrictive setting and require more supports will be able to come to school every day, even in middle school and high school. Um, related services such as speech, um, OTPT will be delivered remotely because those specialists would typically be in multiple buildings okay. and we, we don't want to have that cross contamination or whatever, go moving around like that. So that's what I know about those services. As far as my personal experience this past two and a half months, I found that some of my special ed students, and again, the students I deal with are primarily fully included learning disabilities, um, some other issues, but really they're capable of being in typical general ed classes with supports. Many of them did better remotely if they had a couple of things, if they understood how to use the technology and if they had some support at home with parents. It didn't mean a parent had to be there all the time. I had a lot of working parents who were right on top of things, who we would text each other, I shared my personal cell phone number with all my parents and all my students. Nobody abused it, but parents who would reach out or, you know, I'd say, where's, where's Johnny? And a parent would say, he'll be there in five minutes. So um, a lot of kids did better. And one of the reasons is because they didn't have to posture in front of peers. Hmm. There was an, an, an anonymity, so to speak. So students that were um, often in class cut-ups, I, I mean, I could use a lot of terms, but the ones whose behavior might have been an issue, was it a problem when they were one-on, they felt like they were one-on-one -on, -one on a computer and nobody else was going to see what they did or hear what they did. Teachers had them muted, so they, they focused. Hmm. So I think your, your special, ed need, special needs students who are more capable, I think they will be okay. I know that parents of students with severe needs were really frustrated because they felt that they were home with their kids and they had to be on top of them, which is a reason why coming back, we offering five days live instruction for those students because a parent should not have to be their teacher. It's just not fair. It's not fair to the student. It's not fair to the parent and the teachers are not being um, able to do what they need to do with those students. So, um, you know, we, we've, all our PPT meetings, though, will be um, remote. No parents will be allowed in the buildings at all. Um, I think the gap may widen to some degree, but I, I, I'm not as terrified of, where, of it as I was three months ago. That's good. That, um, that is much more of an optimistic outlook than, than I expected. And that's interesting. I hadn't considered... Um, students who may be acting out uh, and, and the advantages that um, kind of that anonymity bring. Um, now, related to that, though, so Jocelyn, as I said before, and as you noted, um, Dayton has a high poverty rate. Uh, you're dealing with 14,000 students in an urban setting. Um, access just to the technology itself is, is what I know was a problem. Um, what, what are uh, you doing to address that? Uh, how, how is DPS uh, trying to help those students? So I'll first explain in the spring when we um, went virtual um, with almost no notice at all, um, we scrambled as best as we could. Uh, the announcement came March 12th. We had an emergency board meeting on March 13th. And by then we had already had the curriculum team pull together 12 teachers, I believe it was, to make videos that were going to be um, streamed on our DPS channel and on YouTube and our local public uh, broadcast um, company um, to, you know, push these lessons out just to, to students. We were not able at that point to pass out laptops to every student. Um, after about two weeks, after, you know, getting the laptops cleaned and formatted and ready to pass out, we were able to pass out one per household. Um, but we didn't have, not everybody had access to reliable internet. Um, we put mobile Wi-Fi hotspot units on school buses and drove them around the city on a regular schedule so people knew that at two o'clock on Tuesday they could access Wi-Fi close to the house. It wasn't great. It was the best we could do at the, at the time. Um, we're in a very different position now than we were in the spring. Um, I will go back. When we planned on having in-person school earlier this summer, we did have a remote 
option for parents who didn't want to send their children to school. And um, if parents chose that option, they were going to be directed to a third party company that would be for providing um, teaching for that student. When we decided to go all virtual, we decided that we were going to be having Dayton Public School students teach Dayton Public School. Uh, sorry, Dayton Public School teachers teaching Dayton Public School students. We really wanted to preserve the relationship that teachers had, um, keep those ties really close, knowing that lots of students know their teachers already. Uh, they've had older siblings that have had them. It, it will make for a better experience. Um, and we will be having as close to a classroom experience as possible. We're going to be having rooms where there will be class in session. Everybody is expected to show up on time. We're still mandated by the state to have a certain number of instructional hours for the entire school year. So students will be on probably longer than most parents um, like me want their kids on a screen, but we'll have the ability for students to be together in a classroom. And then um, the students that are special education will be pulled out by their special education teachers and have that one-on-one -on -one learning. We have had, um, thankfully, access to CARES money. So we were able to buy uh, Chromebooks for every single student in our district. And every household that needs it is going to have a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot unit. So we are in a very different place, thankfully, and we're hoping that it can provide uh, a start to a better school year. It's going to be much better than in the spring, and I'm really excited to see how the teachers are able to adapt to it. And like Roseanne said, a lot of students did really well with this. Um, my own kids, I have four kids that are in Dayton Public School. Um, they missed their friends. Uh, I was pleased to see how some of them kept up their studies, um, despite not having the really good peer pressure that you get some set that some students get from their friends um it's been hard for a lot of other students so but i think we are lucky in that the equity piece is not something we're struggling with now as we were in the spring that's that's terrific that sounds uh i remember that in the spring it was um i thought the district did a really good job with the resources that you had but it was a bit of a i think and this is probably true for most most districts a bit of a struggle oh how the heck do we pull this off so um, I'm glad to hear that that, that uh, the summer and the planning helped. Um, I want to switch gears for a second. Um, Kathy, how are you seeing companies adapt? You've got a, a, an overview of, uh, of the industry as a, an industry insider. Um, who's doing what? What, what, what? And what sort of things look really promising? And what sort of companies are, maybe, what, what types of companies may be struggling a bit? Um, I think the general trend among the providers of instructional material to move to digital has pro probably helped them a great deal in the spring and certainly is helping them uh, this fall. I think there was a certain amount of uh, frenetic activity and uh, not a lot, small bit of panic in the spring um, because of the pace at which this had to, to change. Um, interestingly, one of the first companies that I spoke with was Learning Without Tears. Its um, main product is handwriting, and they were getting, uh, Terry told me they were getting inundated with calls from parents yeah. wanting materials. Of all, I don't think that's a company I would have thought of, first of all, in terms of, of requests, uh, but they were getting it, and they said that uh, one of the things that helped them uh, enormously was that they had previously done a lot of work with um, professional development, with occupational therapists and um, other uh, professionals. And so they had the kind of PD programs put together that they could easily transfer to parents who were looking for help. And I think that is one of the keys, especially this fall, if it wasn't, if companies didn't have, have it ready in the spring, um, they need to be prepared to help parents who are dealing with their products at, at home and online. Um, the other thing we noticed in the spring was um, a real uptake of various academically based apps we do a quarterly compilation of um, what, how the apps are doing on, you know, like at the Apple Store and, and Google, and um, I think it's Google, Amazon, and, and the App Store, um, the Apple App Store, and what the top selling apps or the top free apps are. 
Um, and there was a, a lot more academically based, whether it was something to do with calculus or it was something to do with reading. Um, parents were really going after the apps. As the problem in the spring that, that I heard most of all on, in terms of the companies was the inability to get a hold of anybody at the school district. And I think it was because school district per personnel were absolutely um, trying to cope with the whole situation themselves. And talking to salespeople was not, not the object. Um, since then, there's been more conversations. And um, the materials that will work in both places that uh, can be toggled back and forth between remote learning and in class are probably the materials that are going to do really well. Um, anything that is complicated for parents is, or the student probably is not going to um, do well because they, they, it won't get used. Um, and I think by and large, uh, certainly the traditional companies have made uh, that were first in print have made their um, materials available digitally and have been doing so. So this is not this is not necessarily something new. On the flip side of that, um, print materials are still being used and the uptake at, at, of them at home. How they're getting them, I'm not quite sure, but I do know of one instance, I think it was in North Carolina, where last spring a teacher actually collected um, the physical textbooks and various materials and drove them around the county to uh, various homes because there are places where kids don't have internet and they need that, um, the physical materials. Yeah, I think that I, um, if I'm not mistaken, if it wasn't DPS, it was one of the neighboring schools where they were printing out packets and you could pick up packet there were, materials. Yeah. There was a lot of that in the spring. And I think that's easier, you know, it's probably easier to work with um, for a lot of people. And you can't, it's very hard to deliver a digital program if kids or parents and their child are having to drive to Taco Bell and to use the internet in order to access the materials. It's, it, you know, it just doesn't work that well. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, let's, let's go back to this idea of uh, access and equity. I mean, COVID-19 is obviously the big story for the year, uh, but so is the Black Lives Matter movement, mm. right? Um, and so, um, Kathy, let's stay with you for a second. How are you seeing, and, and you did a story recently on the capitalization of the letter B, for instance, in, mm -hmm. in material uh, when, when talking about the word black. Um, how are you seeing the Black Lives Matter movement impacting curriculum companies? Um, I think they're on two levels. I think on, on company operations, I think if there isn't already, there will be um, more of a look to integrate their own staff expand their own staff to, um, and I, I think that's included, but uh, are beginning to be included. Um, certainly the number of people that I deal with have has broadened uh, in terms of um, uh, background and ethnicity. Um, but still the last time, you know, we were at big conventions, uh, they were pretty white, pretty male and, and pretty old. Um, so uh, that world, the publishing world still has to change a bit. Um, but I, the areas where I think you'll see really big change, and I think there's interest in change, is um, in English language arts and literature. How, how, what kids are going to be reading, what they're going to be studying, is the, um, is the old guard the thing we should still be doing? And the whole area of social studies. Um, that is going to have to change um, if it isn't already. Um, the way we approach history, what we're, what we're teaching, um, how we're teaching it, um, what subjects, what topics we're discussing. Uh, there's been this movement for civics. Um, there is this 
real undercurrent of social justice. It is a major uh, in large universities. Um, I think that will filter down into K-12 okay. in terms of curriculum materials. Yeah, no, and we're seeing some of that too. I mean, as Nicole mentioned at the outset, um, we have been reviewing customer materials looking for um, bias and, and ensuring equitable coverage. And we've had a, a huge influx of companies coming to us asking for that, that very thing. Um, Jocelyn, you're, you're in the role of helping buy or evaluate materials for, uh, for schools. How does this change what you're looking for or, or does it? Has the school been, has the district been looking at this for a while? What, what does this mean for, uh, for your perspective? So I'm really lucky in that the district that I work that I um, serve in and that the board that I work with, um, this is a topic that we have been talking about for a very long time. Um, since the three years that I've uh, joined the board, it's part of a, every single conversation that we have. Is this an equitable choice? Um, what are we doing to ensure that we're providing um, equity to all of our students? And um, you know, we talk about equity for our students and, and for our teachers and for our staff. And so I'm grateful that this is not a new conversation for us that we can, we're changing. Um, I won't say that we're not changing. Um, you know, we're, we're adjusting with the way that the conversation is changing around us and making sure that we are staying in the forefront of just because we were um, having this conversation in February doesn't mean that the conversation hasn't changed um, into something different now. In June, we passed a resolution as the school board condemning the killing of George Floyd. Our, um, our uh, teachers union president released a statement um, committing to uh, Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, there are, we've been, we've been having conversations about making sure that we have a culturally responsible, culturally responsive curriculum. Um, and we're making sure that we do everything we can to provide that in terms of um, language arts and the exposure that we have, you know, making sure that we are having conversations that truly reflect the, the community around us. Um, but I'm really excited to see the ways that it's going to be different this year. We haven't started having those conversations yet as a board in terms of curriculum. Um, but I think that there is a real opportunity to um, change the way that we talk about it. We might have had a good culturally responsive curriculum before, but I'm excited to see the, the new materials that we bring in, the ways in which we adapt and adjust to the ways that our students are seen on the ground. We have students uh, in high school that I saw in some of the, the marches around our town. And I'm excited to see what they bring to the classroom as well as the, the teachers and the staff as well. Um, equity in our town, which is a very segregated city um, with a very long history of segregation and um, integration, it's a touchy subject. Not everybody is in the same place. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we have conversations that are um, mindful of the fact that not everybody is coming from the same place, but still going forward. Uh, and it's, I, I think that there's a real opportunity to reevaluate what we're doing and making sure that we are um, staying at the forefront of what we understand to be the most equitable in terms of, you know, how we, how we serve our students, but how we educate our students as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Sarah. What are you seeing from a policy standpoint? Anything? Is there movement um, at the at the state level to incorporate some of this in, or is it still too new to tell? Um, I think I think it's it's too new to tell. Um, I think that there was some activity at the state level a little bit in June, but state legislatures have mostly been out aside from emergency sessions um, since May. Um, and uh, they, most of them don't go back in until January. Um, and federally, we haven't seen a lot. I guess we can, we can point to the CARES funds as trying to address some of the equity issues. Um, Jocelyn mentioned that they're using it for mobile hotspots um for folks that don't have internet at home um but i think i think we're still early policy making takes a really long time um at the state and federal level so i think we probably won't see a lot of activity on this until 
specific to education for several months. Um, but again, a lot of the a lot of the activity there starts at the local level. So what folks are doing at the board level, what folks are doing at the school level is really going to be impactful for what state and federal policymakers decide to focus on um, in in the new in I can't believe in 2021 I can't believe it's almost 2021. Do, do you see that um, the results of the 2020 election may sway it in one way or other or that there is an election coming may the, do you think there may be calls in one way or, or the other? Yes um, I think that this this year is a pretty impactful election um, uh, no matter what happens so I think we will see um, whoever wins um, in November, I think, will sort of decide um, a lot. I mean, we're, we're probably nearing um, ESSA reauthorization. We're nearing HE, we, we're past reauthorize. I know this is focused on K-12, but we're past reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, I think a lot of those discussions are going to start happening on what the federal policies are going to look like. So who wins this year um, is probably going to make a lot of decisions that will be impactful for many years to come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, one, one more question. I'll just open this up to the group. Um, what can, uh, you know, what are schools wanting from ed publishers and ed tech uh, companies to better support the, the teachers and the parents? Are there, um, I know, Roseanne, when you and I were talking uh, earlier, uh, kind of prepping for this, you mentioned PD, right? Uh, lots of, lots of PD, uh, both for the parents and the, the, uh, the, the teachers. What do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Are there other ideas that we need to be considering? Well, I, I mentioned in a, in a comment to you that last spring a lot of companies gave free access to their products online, and um, I truly appreciate that. I personally still struggled with trying to use them, but I saw tons of teachers, you know, setting up things with Flipgrid and Nearpod and a lot of things that. Um, I still don't quite understand. Um, I, those are the kind of PDs that me per, as a, personally as an older teacher would really find useful because I know there's a lot of good use to these, but I struggle with trying to set it up on my own, but I don't need a full day PD. Um, I had another company, um, Science Learning, Scientific Learning, I'm not sure, they have a really good reading program and I was given the opportunity to offer that to my students and I reached out to attend a webinar and I was the best customer service I've ever had. I clicked on and I said, I can't come to this webinar on time. I'll be a little late. And someone reached out to me and said, what time are you available? We'll do a one-on-one. -on -one. It's never happened to me with any product. <laughs> and this gentleman spent an hour with me going through my students' sites and showing me how to get them set up and I will be a user for life. So, <laughs> You know, if you could reach out to the teachers and not make it so overwhelming, uh, you know, we don't need a million tools. We need at least, a, you know, a pocket full of really good ones to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn, I saw you nodding a bit. Anything you want to add to that? Um, so I'm not, t I'm not speaking from an educator's perspective, but I'm speaking from a parent's perspective and, um, <sighs> I, I serve on a different board that awards teacher grants to teachers. And they asked me a few weeks ago, ha, you know, teachers aren't going to be in the same room as their students. Um, what should we say to our teachers that are going to be applying to teacher grants for what, what they can look for? Um, it, I am going, I'm, I'm so excited to see the ways in which teachers are going to adapt to this new environment. Um, if there's anybody that can do that, it's, the, the teachers that I know and see in the classroom every single day. Um, my, my thoughts about that is um, anything that's hands-on that people can do as a group is gonna be really, really effective for engaging teachers and students together. Um, I also think that there's a really good opportunity here. So my son last week is an eighth grader and he's nearing the point where he'll start taking foreign language classes in high school and uh, his, his school 
provides the standard Spanish and um, French and German, you know, the, the, the big three. But he said, mom, I want to learn Japanese. And I was thinking there's a huge opportunity for, uh, for schools to be able to say, listen, we don't have a Japanese teacher on staff, um, but this is something that we can see if we can reach out to a third party company to, to fill these credits, but give students different opportunities they would not have normally had in a traditional classroom environment. We still want to make sure that we preserve as much of the like personal relationship that we have um, while having DPS teachers and DPS students together. But, you know, I'm going to be looking into, is there some way that I can supplement what my son is doing? Um, I would love to see if I can enroll him in a Japanese class and still get him have high school credit for it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. I don't have all the answers, but I'm excited to see what happens. Well, I think not having all the answers is sort of the theme for this year. Um, so uh, what, one question that came up, uh, popped up in the chat, um, are schools at this point thinking that they may not go back to the classroom? Uh, you know, are, and I know we're looking at a really small sample set here, but you know, uh, Jocelyn, are you, are you looking at the district and saying, uh, do we need to have a contingency plan in case we can't come back? And Roseanne, in your district, are folks saying, okay, well, here's what happens if we have to make the transition? Um, as far as I know, it's going to be based just on numbers. If this, and I don't know what that number is, but if there's a percentage of increases, um, we will change it up and we'll probably go back to um, a remote. But again, I think we'll have a little um, preparation it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be today we're in school and tomorrow our numbers went up and, and we're closed. So um, even when we went out on September, uh, March 13th, in my district in Norwalk, we didn't close down the next day. We made a decision on Monday that we were going to close at the end of the week. Students, had, we gave them all the day off on a Thursday, which was supposed to be an early dismissal. Teachers came in. We were, we did a little PD where we get it ourselves set up for remote and we also assessed everybody to get a laptop. And so Friday when the kids came back, they all left with laptops. We, we really worked really hard. So I, again, and that was with almost no notice. So I don't envision that we're going to be under that same kind of constraint. If the numbers change, we're going to be prepared. There'll be, I don't know what the plan is, but there will be other plans, plan B, plan B, C, et cetera. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I will say that I'm grateful that we are going virtual for at least the first quarter. So we can see by watching the other districts what's gonna happen. Um, we obviously would love to have a return to in-person classes. We haven't made any decision yet. Before we come back to the classroom, we have to meet a very clear set of benchmarks in terms of public health. But we also had a meeting with our county public health commissioner, and he was very stark about saying, it doesn't matter how good our numbers are. As soon as we open up school again, the numbers are going to go back up. And we're seeing that right now. You know, um, there are universities across the country that are opening back up again. And uh, they're going to have to shut down in just a couple days. Um, we do have a number of schools in the area that are still in person. Most of the public schools are virtual at this point. Um, there are some private schools that are still in person. And I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say I'm grateful that they're going to show us what's going to happen because I don't want anybody to, to mm -hmm. suffer from COVID. This is not anything that I take, um, I take this very seriously, but I think we do have an opportunity to see what's happening around us and be prepared for the eventuality of if we make this decision, this is what's going to happen. Um, yep. If I could just interject, Kevin, we did have live summer school mm. in my town this this year, um, if parents wanted it. And so we did have a, a dry run, if you would, so to speak, um, of trying to you. You make, everybody's wearing masks. Stu if you had a class where you had severely impacted special ed special needs students, teachers were complete PPE with the masks and the gowns and everything if a student couldn't wear the mask. But we really only had one incident where a teacher came to school one day, felt fine, the next the evening didn't feel well, the next day tested positive. They shut down that particular building only for the rest of the week, did a deep clean, and came back and that was the only incident. So I think it is controllable if people adhere to guidelines. 
Um, I know it, uh, there was an article in the paper today that uh, UConn in stores in Connecticut has screenings of all the students coming in and they felt that really was positive because they found one kid came in with screening tested positive. They were able to send them back before they entered the dorms, before they entered any of the building. So, you know, you have to be proactive and um, I mean, I'm not looking forward to teaching in a mask, but that's the reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah, are you seeing any areas uh, where states or districts are just saying, nope, we're not even gonna try to go back? Or are, are any of you seeing, we're just not gonna try to go back, we're just gonna go all, all online this year? Not, I'm not seeing anything for the full year yet, um, but I think, I think we are going to start seeing some of the stories coming from the colleges that are open. I mean, I'm seeing where I graduated, where I went to school is opening and it's in a small rural town. And if that town, there's one hospital and it has to serve the entire county. And that's, that's a huge, that could be a huge impact if that, if stuff starts happening there. So I think, I think we will see. Um, but again, like I said, earlier, um, policymakers, this is a really hard thing because no, one, no decision is a good decision. Um, uh, all decisions you're choosing from a lot of bad choices. And um, this is not where people want to be. And these are not decisions that are fun to make or easy to make. So um, I think I think everyone's everyone's learned a little bit of grace over these past several months, but um, emotions are running um, a little high too. So I think it's I think it's going to be hard. Um, and I think I, I know I know um, we all know that an election is coming up, and I think we're going to see a lot of those emotions mm -hmm. um, running a lot higher. Um, and I think the rhetoric is going to get a lot more um, um, a lot more pointed because of it. Yeah. Um, so we've got about just, just under 15 minutes left. I have one more topic that I want to touch on, but I want to make sure that we have time for, I've gotten five or six questions that have come in. Uh, so uh, Sarah and Kathy, this, ne this next question is directed at uh, both of you. And I would just ask, um, you know, if you could sort of quick give, give us a brief answer on it. Um, but we've talked, uh, we haven't really talked about the economy right, and the economic losses that states are likely uh, to be seeing. Um, Kathy, uh, we saw a bit of this in 2008 and 2009 and how hit that hit the industry. How, how are you, what, what are you seeing here? Are there, are there comparisons? Are we in better shape, worse shape? Uh, there are comparisons. Um, the recession uh, of 2008 was officially over in June of 2009. Uh, state budgets took I think about five or six years to, to recover, and that, of course, impacted uh, funding for schools. Um, the industry itself uh, seemed to come back a little faster, which I think uh, was mostly because state budgets at that time were concentrating on K-12 um, as soon as they could return money uh, to funding. Um, this time around, I think the condition of higher education, uh, which increasingly is dire, is going to be real competition in terms of, of state funding for the public schools. Um, it's, it's always seen to be that K-12 is a budget priority, but there's going to be a lot of demand on higher ed for support uh, from somebody. Um, they're going to need it. Um, because they have been underfunded for a long time to begin with. Um, so in terms of coming back, uh, that really is a function of the economy coming back. Um, how quickly that can come back and the tax revenue can start coming back or the federal government does whatever it does in terms of printing money. Um, there is gonna have to be some help and Sarah, what are you seeing from, I know you said that the state legislatures have not uh, really had a chance to convene. So this may be sort of a, a conjecture, but what, what are you seeing? Sure, well, federally Congress passed the CARES Act um, in the spring, which was a decent, uh, a chunk of money that went to K-12 and higher education. 
but they there has been bipartisan support for additional uh, legislation that would send money to that that would include funds for schools. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to come to an agree. Congress has not been able to come to an agreement of what that looks like um, and what a larger stimulus package would be. Um, and so I think I think there's still a chance that that might happen. So if that happens, um, what will states be able to do with that money? I think there's been some discussion of states being able to use that money to plug their budget holes that they will be in. So it could get to a point where there's money for K-12 schools, but the states end up using it so that the schools don't have to cut 20% of their budget. Um, it's sort of it's it's sort of plugging holes where they can, um, but like Kathy said, this is going to be if it's anything like two, 2008, it's going to take several years to dig out of this hole. Um, and I, I think school school budgets are going to be impacted, unfortunately, just the same as everything else. Okay. Um, all right. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. We've got some questions. Um, Seja asked, how are we addressing the needs of ELLs and multilingual families during this time? And how do you measure language proficiency and ensure language growth in these contexts? Uh, does anybody want to tackle that one? Um, I, I'm not an ELL teacher. I will tell you that along with our special needs students, ELL students, depending on their scores, we have a test technique called, called Lost Links. I don't know what that stands for, but it has to do with the reading, writing, and speaking proficiency. Depending on their scores, students who are really in need will also have the opportunity to be in school five days a week, mm. along with special needs, so they get that. Um, and I will just say my little piece, which is, again, not ELL, but I have a large percentage of parents who don't speak English. And I actually had a better relationship with them remotely because I used Google Translator. And I would send email blasts and I would make sure I translated everything. And then I told them they could reach out to me in their native language and I would translate it. And it didn't matter whether they were sending me a text message or an email. I actually started to have conversations per se with parents who up until now, I only talked with a translator. Um, so there wasn't a, an intermediary and I found that much more rewarding. And I think that we kind of bridged relationships for parents that don't speak English, in my personal experience. Interesting, interesting. Um, all right, next question, uh, and this will open up for the group. Uh, this comes from Erica. Uh, what do you believe are the least discussed topics? So we've touched on a lot of the big themes, but uh, lesser, you know, lesser covered um, that you think might actually have a meaningful impact on the next few years regarding K-12 education. I think I, I mentioned it before um, in the way there's there's almost nothing that isn't getting some conversation, but I think uh, the immediacy of the moment, I think there are going to have to be deeper conversations. And I think this is uh, two of them are going to be about uh, the whole social studies and English language arts literature areas that is going to take some real uh, conversation about how not just what kind of curriculum to make but in, in schools about how we want to approach that okay. and what changes need to be made good and jocelyn i thought i saw you about to jump in as well anything to add sure i'm going to go a completely different area i don't feel like we are talking enough uh, hearing enough from our legislators at the statewide level about um standardized testing um we are at a very unique juncture so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of dps history um we're one of the lowest test score districts in the state um we narrowly avoided state takeover last year we're really proud of the gains that we made we are really really concerned about what virtual a very necessary virtual education but what a virtual education is going to do to our te standardized test scores um, we got a pass last year when everything was suspended in march um, but as of now we still have all the mandates from the state in terms of like what i mentioned before the in-classroom uh, instructional hours the standardized testing um, we have a real opportunity right now to change the way that we educate our students. But if we are held to the same standardized testing requirements, we can't change as much as we want to. Um, 
if I could wave a magic wand, I would like to eliminate the standardized testing experience that we have right now for five years and see how our teachers adapt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm so worried about what we're going to have to do and what we're going to face this year because of that. Interesting. Yeah. No, I Oh, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll add to that. I think there's been some discussion. Uh, the CARES Act did allow the Secretary of Education to waive certain rules. Um, and she, and um, she did waive um, the assessment requirement for this spring. Um, and I know that there has been some discussion about what assessments need to look like in the future, um, whether that is, because we're gonna need to figure out where kids are um, and how, how to go about doing that and how to go about um, addressing or identifying the interventions that kids need. Um, how, what is the best way to do that? Um, and I know that I have heard discussions um, amongst various groups of diverse groups of people about whether or not um, those assessments need to just look at where the kids are and not be punitive on the schools um, and what and what that should be and how long that would go. Um, so I think there's some of those discussions happening, but I um, really think it's, it's, a, it's a good conversation to keep having um, as we figure out how, what, what kids need. And I'd like to piggyback on, on that really quickly, Sarah. You're absolutely right that like, we still need to make sure that our students are, are making gains and um, getting the education that we're trying to give them, but not having the punitive aspect of it. I think that speaks more to the struggles that Dayton in particular has had. Um, but to go back to the equity question, you know, the educational divide between districts that are wealthy and not wealthy is stark. We know that, you know, it, educational, uh, the, the standardized test scores are very much a reflection of the wealth of the district. Um, and a district such as mine that has a high poverty rate that already deals with lots of educational equity issues, you know, we're right next door to some really wealthy, high performing educational districts. Um, a lot of their students are going to be fine in ways that our students are, and we need to make sure that we do not punish students for the fact that we are in a very new environment and we're all adjusting and some students just aren't able to access education or utilize education, even with the opportunities that we're giving them. We just need to make sure that we are handling things with grace and trying to provide a high quality education to every student um, without punishing the districts for things that are beyond our control. Excellent, thank you. We have two questions. One, I don't think we're gonna to get to from Terry, who's an intervention specialist, but I think Roseanne, you're well poised to answer that one. So I will send you that in email and then Nicole can connect with Terry on the answer to that one. Um, and then the last one came in through, uh, through the chat. Jenny asked how this is impacting the media center and school library. How's it changing the needs of the media specialist, which is not an area we've discussed at all. Anyone have any thoughts about that? I don't have any specific thoughts, but I know my school is going through a huge change. Um, we completely ripped out all the bookshelves over the summer and the library is going to be a real center. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to be used, but the person who's taking over the position is really poised to provide tremendous support and technology and digitally um, for teachers and for students so that things could be done um, online I will miss the old fashioned library, but I, but I know there's big changes there. I can't say specifically what they're going to be, but they're in the works. Okay, so yeah, I think we don't know, uh, which is again, sort of where we are. Um, well, thank you everyone. Um, it, it, we've reached the end of our time. I appreciate uh, all of my panelists. Nicole, I think you had a couple of words you wanted to add, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you also to Kathy, Roseanne, Sarah, and Jocelyn for sharing your observations about um, how the impacts of COVID are going to trickle down you know, to schools as they uh, begin the year. Um, for all of you who joined us today, thank you very much for uh, taking part in the discussion. We received some really excellent questions and we look forward to sharing out the recording of the webinar along with a full transcript of the questions and answers so that you can watch it or share it with colleagues who weren't able to join us today. 
If you'd like to learn more about the products and services that Westchester provides, you can visit our website at westchestereducationservices.com. I also put that in the chat area. Um, and if you have any questions or comments about today's session, you can email me directly at nicole.tomasi, that's one M, two S's, at westchestereducationservices.com. Um, last but not least, there will be a brief one minute survey at the conclusion of the webinar and I would really appreciate if you could share your feedback because that helps us to bring you additional content that is of interest to you. So I want to thank everybody once again for joining us for this discussion and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.